Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff. And a big thank you to my patrons on Patreon for your contributions to my channel. Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to be talking about the mechanism of thoracic outlet syndrome, or TOS, T-O-S, its acronym. And to do that, we really need to take a look at some of the basic anatomy. So we'll start off by looking at this structure right here that's outlined in this red color right here. This is what's called the superior thoracic aperture. Now, the superior thoracic aperture is made up of several structures. Posteriorly, can't really see it too well, but it's the body of the T1 vertebra. Laterally, we have the first ribs on either side, so this one would actually be the patient's right first rib, and then basically the top of the sternum, which is the manubrium right here, and then over here would be the left first rib. And this basically makes up a space called the superior thoracic aperture. And this structure that we're talking about is also called the thoracic inlet. And there's many structures that enter or exit through this inlet, depending on how you want to think about it. For example, the esophagus goes vertically and goes through the thoracic inlet. Same thing with the trachea, it goes vertically through it. And then if we think about structures coming directly off of the heart here within the thorax, right here we have the brachiocephalic vein. Uh, behind that's the brachiocephalic artery, which divides into the common carotid artery going up. And then here's the subclavian artery. Here's the subclavian vein. Now one little nuance here is technically when the subclavian artery and vein pass over the margin of the first rib right here, they actually become axillary artery and axillary vein. So actually at this point right here where the dot is, this is actually axillary artery, this is actually axillary vein. But the whole point is, is these structures actually originate from uh, within the thorax and they move out through this thoracic inlet. One thing important to know for later is that the brachial plexus does not actually move through the thoracic inlet. Okay. On another note, we also have this inferior thoracic aperture, which is not shown here because it's all the way down by the T12 vertebra at the bottom of the rib cage. These are very technical terms right here. So if you try to do a quick Google search, you might end up a little confused. And that's because whenever two or more scientists are studying the same thing at the same time, there's a chance they may name things differently. And so historically, in some circles, the thoracic inlet up here by T1 was also called the thoracic outlet. And that's the origin of the term thoracic outlet syndrome. So it's not down by T12, it's actually at the thoracic inlet, it's just named thoracic outlet syndrome. It's just a historical thing. Now here's some more anatomy over here. So in this picture, we're looking at the right side of the upper rib cage. So over here is the manubrium. Here's the body of the sternum. Right here's rib three, rib two, here's rib one, and then here's the clavicle. And then here's some cervical vertebrae up here. We also see three very important muscles that are collectively termed the scalenes. This one out in front is the anterior scalene. The one in the middle is the middle scalene, and the one in the back is the posterior scalene, which doesn't play as much of a role in thoracic outlet syndrome as the middle and anterior scalenes might. Now the anterior and the middle scalenes sort of form a triangle, if you want to think of it that way. They form a triangle. They start up here, go down to a corner here, a corner here, and then there's a space between the two scalenes called the interscalene space. Now this yellow structure that's emerging from within that interscalene space and moving out laterally, this is the brachial plexus. So an important point here is that the brachial plexus emerges from between the anterior and middle scalenes through that interscalene space. Then we have this space here called the costoclavicular space which lies between the clavicle superiorly and the first rib inferiorly. Now there's three important structures here that pass through that costoclavicular space. The first two are the subclavian artery and subclavian vein. Now technically, once they pass over that first rib, they become axillary artery and axillary vein, but that's not important. What is important is that they emerge from within the thorax and they come through that thoracic inlet, okay, and then they go through that costoclavicular space. The brachial plexus, you can see, comes from that interscalene space within the scalene triangle, and then it goes through 
that costoclavicular space. So the brachial plexus is not actually moving through the thoracic inlet, even though it is associated with this syndrome. We'll talk about why that is on the next slide. And then the third space right here is the pectoralis minor space. You'll notice all three of these structures, the brachial plexus, which is probably more terminal branches now, so actual nerves that are named, uh, now the axillary artery and the axillary vein, notice that they actually pass under the proximal part of this pectoralis minor muscle, um, really the more tendinous part over here. And once they pass underneath uh, the tendinous part of pectoralis minor, uh, then they basically are going to enter the axilla and move through the upper extremity. Okay, So hopefully you understand these three spaces because they're all going to play a role here. So this black line right here represents the brachial plexus. So we know that the brachial plexus actually moves between the anterior and middle scalenes right here through that interscalene space. And then it passes through that costoclavicular space, so under the clavicle and above that first rib. And then it moves into the pectoralis minor space and then ultimately through the axilla into the upper extremity. Over here's the posterior scalene. You can see it inserts on the second rib, meaning it plays a negligible role in thoracic outlet syndrome. But the anterior and middle scalenes look here. You can't really see it too well because of the clavicle, but these two muscles actually insert on the first rib. And that's important because of one of their actions. They have a bunch of actions depending on which scalene, but one that's common is that they elevate the first rib, so rib one elevation. For example, when you inhale actively, you're bringing your rib cage up so that way the lungs can expand, right? And so by pulling up on that first rib, they help to elevate that part of the rib cage. So how could the anterior and middle scalenes be implicated in thoracic outlet syndrome? Well, let's suppose that you have tight scalenes. So just muscle tightness, right? So anterior scalene is tight, middle scalene is tight. What is their action? Well, they insert on the first rib, and so their action is to elevate that first rib. Well, if these two muscles are tight, there's going to be excessive elevation of that first rib. And so tight scalenes, particularly anterior and middle, are going to lead to less space and more compression here for the contents in the costoclavicular space, so compression on the nerves here in the brachial plexus, that will lead to uh, muscles being weak, muscles that are innervated by these nerves. They may atrophy also. Uh, in terms of the sensation, you may have paresthesia, so numbness, tingling, burning sensations in the upper extremity, and also arterial symptoms and venous symptoms. Some tests for thoracic outlet syndrome involve palpating the radial pulse as you move the arm up over the head. And so sometimes when the arm moves over the head with thoracic outlet syndrome, the radial pulse is lost because you get more compression on this axillary artery. And so the reason the radial pulse would be diminished is because of that compression, possibly due to these scalenes being tight. Also note that if these two scalenes are tight, that can also compress the interscalene space of the scalene triangle. And so you can actually have the compression more proximally up here in addition to um, having less costoclavicular space. So how do you remedy this situation? Well, uh, here's two things you can do that we'll talk about in more detail in later videos. Uh, the first thing is a simple scalene stretch. If the scalenes are tight, stretch them. Also, sometimes the first rib uh, can actually be hypomobile independent of the scalenes. And so sometimes it may serve to actually manipulate or mobilize the first rib uh, so that way it can move better and doesn't get stuck in position where it could potentially compress those structures in the costoclavicular space. There's one more thing to talk about with respect to thoracic outlet syndrome, and that's with the pectoralis minor muscle. Here's the structure of pectoralis minor. Uh, it actually originates here off of the anterior costal cartilages of ribs 3, rib 4, and rib 5. It's a convergent muscle, so as it goes up like this, it's going to insert on the coracoid process of the scapula. Now, as we talked about at the start of the video, remember that uh, the terminal branches of the brachial plexus, the axillary artery, and axillary vein run underneath uh, the proximal part of this muscle, the more tendinous part. Now you can see the black line here representing that. They travel under this. This is that pectoralis minor space. So what would happen if the pectoralis minor muscle was tight? Well, if the pectoralis minor muscle is tight, it's possibly going to compress the contents going through the pectoralis minor space. 
Again, you're going to have compression of those terminal branches, which are basically just nerves coming from the brachial plexus, compress the axillary artery, compress the axillary vein, and you're going to see very similar manifestations um, as you would with the scalene situation on the previous slide. So again, tightness in the pectoralis minor uh, can cause compression on any of those structures, and that will cause the symptoms of thoracic outlet syndrome. One other thing that can also cause compression of these structures in the pectoralis minor space is really bad chronic slumped rounded shoulder posture. So when you're slumped over, over your computer all day, and you get these rounded shoulders chronically, well that means that the scapula are coming too far forward in protraction. And that actually can create less space here uh, for the structures running through. And so again, that can also compress these structures, the brachial plexus, arteries and veins, and lead to thoracic outlet syndrome. However, a tight pectoralis minor is a much more common cause than simply slouched posture, but it can contribute. So how do you fix that situation? Well, you can perform exercises like active scapular retraction. Rows are a good exercise for this. Um, that's because rows stretch the pectoralis minor. In fact, they do so actively by contracting the antagonist that can actually give you a little bit of extra stretch of the pectoralis minor. But you can also do passive stretches of the pectoralis minor muscle. Hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of the mechanism of thoracic outlet syndrome. In future videos, we'll be going more in detail over the treatments and then also how we differentiate thoracic outlet syndrome from something following a nerve root problem or a peripheral nerve problem. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.